your uh, really informative presentation, uh, explaining a difficult topic visually and, and very clearly to me. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm really um, looking forward to some of the questions we will have. Um, what I would like to do briefly is just uh, give a recap of, of what we've heard today before we jump into the Q&A session. Uh, for the audience, uh, just to, to let you know, we started with parvovirus today, a re-emerging pathogen, in my opinion, based on the evidence that was shared uh, by Professor Streck. Uh, and perhaps another example of why wild boar uh, needs to be controlled. Um, of course, ASF is, is, is the main reason, but uh, uh, perhaps we are... Uh, seeing that the wild boar is behaving as a reservoir and a vehicle for viral evolution that is then uh, destabilizing commercial production, which I think is a really interesting uh, concept from a sort of a ecology and evolution standpoint. We also heard that these uh, new uh, emerging strains are different in their uh, immunogenicity and may um, have a different uh, neutralizing uh, response when we uh, vaccinate with some of the existing uh, commercial vaccines. Uh, but on the other hand, we also see that those vaccines are providing some level of, of clinical protection. And um, then following that introduction, Marius shared with us the latest uh, Beringer Ingelheim uh, vaccine product including some very interesting efficacy results, uh, which I'm sure will be discussed and uh, further explored during the Q&A. Uh, basically, we saw that a new construct with a, a recent strain was able to very effectively uh, protect against a, a severe viral challenge in, in a laboratory study. So that was very interesting. The th uh, third speaker today was Enrique Mateo. We just heard him present. Uh, he shared with us the background, the explanation on how PERS uh, is behaving behind the scenes and uh, evolving very rapidly through these recombination events, uh, which are a natural part of the virus. I think um, that's uh, probably um, a lot of what is happening in the field without us knowing until perhaps recently where we have developed the tools to identify these uh, recombination events. And perhaps we are recognizing them more often uh, when we are applying uh, vaccines and sequencing to uh, vaccinated herds because we recognize those uh, sequences very well. Uh, I think also there was some really important advice from Enrique about what we can do practically as, as veterinarians in the field to reduce these recombinants from occurring, particularly the recombinants uh, around uh, both wild type uh, viruses, but also wild type and vaccines or vaccines with each other. And the, this advice in my mind is very practical and it makes a complicated topic quite simple. Uh, so I'll try to summarize this, Enrique, and, and maybe you can jump in and, and correct if I'm wrong, but uh, basically recombination is a natural behavior of PERS. Uh, it happens for good reasons, for, for evolution and survival of, of the fittest uh, virus. So it's part of its normal behavior. And we should stop helping the virus by implementing uh, better biosecurity to reduce the introduction of new strains to our herds. I think this is critical. We need to also adapt and manage the way we vaccinate to minimize the risk by using a whole herd approach, ensuring that all the animals are vaccinated and, and don't allow uh, escape pathways for the field virus. We need to avoid vaccinating too close with two different strains of MLV vaccines. Again, a minimum of 21 days uh, gap is what you proposed and, and perhaps the longer the better. Um, and, and finally, we need to understand what is happening on our farms better and therefore investigate any outbreaks in a vaccinated herd by detecting the virus and then sequencing it, but not focusing just on O5 or O7. Perhaps to really understand what is going on, we need to sequence the whole uh, genome, which is 
more affordable, more uh, available to us today than it was maybe three years ago even. So in essence, we've got quite a lot of viral evolution in our uh, topics today. And I would like to start a little bit um, with, with a question around uh, that topic. Uh, first, for Professor Streck, but, but I think, uh, Enrique, you know parvovirus very well too, so I'm sure we'll have a good, a good dialogue on that topic. So why is it so important for a viral like, virus like, like parvo in this case to have viral diversity? What, what advantage does this confer the virus? And then what impact could that have uh, when we have co-infections? So um, maybe you can split that into two questions. So one, what's, what's this benefit to the virus? Then secondly, maybe talk about co-infections with perhaps PERS and PAVO or, or, or PAVO and other, other viruses. So that's the Perfect. That's, that's a very good question. I will say that for a virus, it's very important to have diversity because the, the evolutionary process of the virus is, uh, is quite different of we understand for evolution, for example. Uh, like, like humans, uh, usually uh, a, a very nice specimens, a specimens of, of a human being married with another very nice species of another human being. And, well, if you see in this, in this progress, we try to get a better fitness in our species. We try to get all the best genes in our species. And the idea is to get the, uh, a, a, a better uh, and, and, and better uh, genetic pool in our descendants. However, for virus, uh, this thought don't work very, very well. In some virus, for example, some DNA, uh, RNA virus, uh, for example, they, they use a, a quasi-specimen systems where they really don't care to, to get a better fitness in, in, their, in their descendants, but what they care is to get a lot of diversity, a very huge pool of diversity, and one of these virus will be succeed in to, to infect and to, to, to start to, to produce another des, uh, descendants that will be also, that will have also a very large pool of, of gene, uh, gene diversity. And because of that, it's, it's very important to the virus to get this diversity. For us um, virologists, that's a very huge problem because this diversity means that maybe we have some vaccine failure, maybe we have some, um, some new host adaptation process like is this process that we, we, we have seen now in, in coronavirus and that, that's a, a great problem and therefore we need to take always care with this uh, hetero, uh, with this viral diversity. And in the second question, um, to, to see, to understand the importance of the wild borns and mostly the importance of the co-infection. Uh, yes, I, I think that's, that's quite important to try to understand this, this, this co-infection. However, today we are trying to understand the co-infection in the, in the, uh, in the mummification material. That means when the co-infection happens, uh, usually it happens two, three, four uh, weeks in the past, and we already lost that windows of co-infection. And therefore, our studies observing the co-infection with PPV and circovirus and other virus uh, peers as well, uh, they, they have a lack, of, a lack of, of information. We have a little bit difficulty to, to perform this, this, this process. Perhaps with, for example, 
uh, next generation sequencing, we could reach uh, a, a better scenario and to understand a little bit this this relations that the virus, one virus perform with another. But in the moment for PPV, we really don't know. We know that we have, for example, a lot of new uh, PPVs. However, we cannot correlate this PPV with clinical science and we cannot correlate this, this PPV with another virus or another PPV. Uh, I think we need to perhaps uh, make a, a methodology change to, to get it. Uh, a scenario that we'll cover tomorrow, um, you know, uh, the presentation from Dr. Aruna, she will actually help guide us through some of the pitfalls of diagnosis of, of these uh, complex uh, infections with, with mummification and stillborn, etc. So uh, for, for the audience, look forward to that tomorrow. Um, Enrique, any comments you'd like to make to this uh, issue of, of uh, you know, viral evolution as a, as a concept? And, you know, tied to that, a question from the audience, which, uh, which I think is, is quite controversial, I would say, is, uh, you know, if this is making the wild-type virus fitter, this, this evolution, this recombination, should we reduce the use of, of modified live vaccines to reduce the number of emergent recombinant viruses? Okay, the, the, the first thing that we have to understand is that evolution is a natural thing. I mean, I think this is very important. Evolution is a part of life. And uh, if we see what happened in viruses, we have different models of evolution in viruses, and, 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 and my colleague explained that very well. But at the end, what happens is that every organism finds a path. I mean, all the existing, existing organisms in, on Earth are here because they found a path to exist. Mm -hmm. And this is evolution, finding the path to exist. So first question to understand. The second question about the use of vaccines. Uh, for me, the answer is very simple. Let's imagine that instead in 2020, we are in 1941 or in 1942. In 1942, the question was not antibiotic resistance. In 1941 or 42, the question was how we can synthesize penicillin in the lab to be used. If we were back at the 60s or 70s, the question was, can we produce new antibiotics for treating other infections, for having a broader uh, scope of these treatments? Can we save more lives? If we go back to the 2000s, the question is, we have to use antibiotics, but we have to use it in a different way. We are doing pretty much the same. We have vaccines, and at the first the point was, okay, we have vaccines, we're very happy. We have vaccines, we will solve all the problems. And then we realize for some vaccines, we have very good efficacy, one, close to 100%. They are very efficient, so that's perfect. For some other vaccines, maybe efficacy, efficacy is not that good. And the question here was, is better or is preferable to have these vaccines or to have not? And my answer is very clear, it's preferable to have it. Without those vaccines, for me, it would be very difficult to manage PERS in the farms. My question now is not, should I vaccinate or not? My question now is, what is the best approach for vaccinating my animals without producing any of the things that are unwanted? And we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So the question is not more or less, is with, since we know more, we have to use it better. And this will happen in the future as well. I'm pretty sure that Beringer or any other company will produce better vaccines in the next future. We saw today an example with the new parvovirus vaccine. So this is an awesome evolution. We are finding the path <laughs> to control the pathogen as, as the world changes. Thank you, Enric. Uh, that's, uh, of course, how BI feels about it too. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad uh, you, you didn't say the, the vaccines were not a good option. Um, 
quick question because uh, time is flying and I'm, I'm very conscious of everybody's time. Um, uh, question for, for Marius uh, from, from the audience. Is there any data, or, or for Professor Streck, uh, any data on parvovirus strains in outdoor production? Is there any evidence that uh, they're different? Because obviously uh, wild boar come into closer contact with, with outdoor production. Do we have any evidence of differences versus indoor pigs? Professor Streck, you want to go ahead? I don't want to argue with the professor. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Uh, well, I really don't see any study about this, this subject, but it would be very, very nice to, to understand this process, mainly in, in populations that don't have this, this process of, of regular vaccination. Uh, just one add-on question, but as long as we apply um, the same protocols for the pigs that are raised um, outdoors, for example, meaning... Uh, probably also the same vaccination protocol, would you expect still differences? Because what you have seen um, or what you have presented very nicely on that one slide that we saw the uh, decrease of um, diversity from the 1980, from, from, from the middle, middle 80s, no? like 1985 onwards. So as long as we apply the same measurements for or the same protocols for, for outdoor raised pigs. Um, would be interesting to see if we see also the, the same um, uh, shrinking in diversity in those pigs. Well, Marius, in my opinion, uh, we have another process uh, that happened in the usual, uh, a usual commercial farm that is a very uh, restricted hygienic protocol. And I think this protocol will play a very important role for the, the virus evolution as well. For example, we, we use usually all in, all out. And I think these protocols will, will be very important to the, the virus as well. Thank you both for your answer. Uh, another question for Enrique. Um, does recombination occur less often between PERS type 2 strains? And does it, has it ever been documented to, to see a recombination between a type 1 and a type 2? And I, I guess the follow-up question, because I've had this in the field, is what if I vaccinate with a type 1 and a type 2 vaccine? Am I okay? Can I do it without any of the advice that you gave earlier? Okay. Uh, regarding the first question, uh, when we published some years ago the first epidemiological study on recombination in the Journal of Virology, the frequency of recombination in type 2 seemed to be a little bit lower. But you have to be very careful because this, depend, this depends on the data that you have available. I mean, since we don't have regular studies on the frequency of recombinations, we cannot absolutely say that. My personal view is that there is no reason to say that one type will be more frequent in recombination events than the other. The second question, at present, we don't have any evidence of recombination between one and two, but again, we are not having the data on hand. I mean, if you think of that, the place where more coexistence of type one and type two happens is in China or in Asia in general, and the data coming from there are very scarce, or at least to me are very scarce. And uh, finally, about your question, should I vaccinate or may I use the vaccine type 1 and type 2 in the same herd? My answer is why you want to do that. You have both viruses, maybe think of eradicating the virus of your, from your farm, or maybe you have to check your biosecurity instead of doing all the things before. As, as always, a, a very practical and uh, clear answer, uh, Enrique. Thank you very much. I have had a question from the audience about the uh, slides, the, the material. The presentations will be available through post.com for participants of the meeting to follow uh, again uh, in their own time. So people will be able to see, see the content again. And I I know how you feel because there was so much uh, density of information there that uh, it sometimes takes a while to to pick up some of these concepts. And if you have further questions, uh, please continue to send them to us. 
and we will pass them along and, and try and answer uh, the, those important questions uh, to to the audience. So uh, uh, with that, I want to really thank uh, Enrique Mateo. Thank you very much for joining us today. Peter Best, thank you for helping us with the interview. Uh, Professor Streck, great to uh, meet you virtually and, and to listen to your uh, great information on Pavo. And finally, Marius, good, good to see you and thank you for your uh, participation. And, and all of you in the audience, uh, fantastic to see you virtually and uh, to have you here online. Uh, please join us tomorrow where we'll have uh, more interesting presentations and discussions and uh, really looking forward to that tomorrow. So with that, thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.